All right, let me tell you about our speaker for tonight. Karen DeRoche is a professional engineer turned community organizer. In 2009, she co-founded the Tampa 912 Project, a flourishing grassroots organization in the Tampa area educating and promoting our nation's history and American founding principles to adults and children. In 2010, she co-led a highly successful campaign that stopped a county sales tax hike. Where were you back in October? <laughs> we, we had a county hike here, yeah. Um, <clears throat> county sales tax hike, despite the issue trailing in the polls before her PAC's involvement and despite a significant monetary disadvantage. During the 2012 election cycle, she built up relationships with several grassroots organizations and managed a top producing volunteer phone bank and canvassing center in Hillsborough County. In 2013, she joined the Heritage Foundation's sister organization, Heritage Action, as their Florida grassroots manager. So with that, I'll bring Karen up. Um, I, I know several of you in here, and I'm just so um, happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, those who have heard my presentation before, hopefully it won't be too boring, but there's always issues coming up in D.C., so I'm always rotating what the issue of the, of the week is, so to speak, so hopefully um, you'll find um, some, some good value in it. But um, yes, I am with the Heritage Action. We're a relatively new organization. We are the sister organization of the Heritage Foundation that they've been around for over 40 years. In 2010, when Obamacare was being um, kind of rammed through Congress, they couldn't really do a whole lot to stop it other than publish papers and you know, try and, and talk with certain elected officials. Um, the way the IRS structure was, they, you know, they had a cap on the amount of lobbying and advocacy they could do. So um, that's how Heritage Action got formed. We're a 501c4, so we can do an unlimited amount of lobbying. And, um, and that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is our lobbying, um, how we do that, how we um, have an inside game up in DC and we really depend on our outside game so much, which um, we have activists in each of the congressional districts we call Sentinels. And I have, uh, I see a couple of Sentinels in the room. I know Mark is and I know Vance is um, and hopefully are there any others that I'm missing? Oh, okay, Jer and I think Andy as well. So. Yeah, there you go. And I always forget to say this, so I'm just going to say it now. I have sign-ups in the back. I'm going to talk a little bit about the program. If you'd like to join, just fill out the form in this little basket, and we'll get you all set up. So that's kind of the commercial on the, the foundation. So the Sentinel program, um, I mentioned the inside-outside game. Um, before, when you have, um, you know, you're trying to advocate on an issue, you know, you, you basically want to try and get in that message in front of your, your um, legislator. In this case, we work on federal issues, so it'd be our representatives in the House and then our members of Congress, or senators. So um, the old way is, you know, we've got activists here, and then we, I hate the word in this graph, lobbyists, because I do not like the word lobbyist, but we do have a team up in D.C. who does lobby on behalf of Heritage Action. And they're uh, wonderful, wonderful um, folks that really um, I've learned a lot from. Um, they're, and they're all a lot younger than me. But, um, but, but we're, we're going along and we decided a couple years ago, in 2013, when I um, came on board, that we really needed to kind of link, have a link between the Sentinel activists on the ground and what we're doing up in D.C. So we have regional coordinators. Um, I represent the state of Florida, so I try and look at all the different congressional districts and, and try to make sure that our members of Congress are hearing from conservatives in each district. So we try and have dialogues. We um, I'll send out a weekly email, kind of update what's going on this week in Congress, and um, looking for intel that you might have, um, you know, from maybe your phone calls, maybe attending a town hall. Um, it, it, you know, if you're not sure if it's interesting, just shoot me an email and, and you'll be surprised at how sometimes it can be very vital information. So that's kind of how we work. Um, Sentinels, we've got our, our GR staff and team and, and we're sharing information back and forth. And it goes the other way. We might get some intel from um, the DC and that might be helpful for you to um, take into a town hall or um, you know, if you're lucky enough to get a, a meeting with your member when they're in recess. 
So that's kind of how the formula works. We have a website, heritageaction.com, and one of the things that we are known for is our scorecard. I think several organizations, there's wonderful organizations out there like Conservative Review and um, several others that do scorecards, and we do that as well. Um, so if you go to our website and you're interested in, you know, where does um, my member of Congress stand, this is the way you do it. Is most everybody in here Representative Webster's district? Okay, anybody in a different district? Okay, good. Got the right one. Hmm. Um, so when you pull up the scorecard, this one happens to be the Senate, and what we do is we score each session. So we just finished the 113th in December, and now we're in the 114th session. So I pulled some of the senators to Rubio and, and Nelson, you know, and then um, here's Mike Lee and Mitch McConnell. So for those two years, in 2013 and 2014, the average Republican scored 63% on our score. The average Democrat scored 3%. <laughs> Senator Nelson, after 57 votes, scored a 0%. <laughs> um, and uh, the way this works is we have different issues that we key vote. I think my battery's dying. <laughs> um, we have key votes there, that there's three there. One, um, one happens to be the National Defense Authorization. Included a lot of uh, land grabs by the federal government, had nothing to do with defense. So, um, so we key voted an amendment to strike that out. And you'll see um, the, the check mark in the little circle means that we are for the amendment. That's, we put out a key vote alert. We give as much advance notice as we can uh, to the members and send it to every member of Congress who's going to vote on that. So they know our position clearly spelled out. This is the issue, this, these are the reasons why we're either for it or against it. So they get plenty of notification. Um, so if you ever see a blue box then next to ours is always on orange. So when you see blue, you know that they are against our position. Any vote that you see in orange matches up and aligns with our position on that. So when you have 57 votes, you just kind of do the math and that's how we come up with those percentages. Um, Rubio, after two years, scored 82%, so you can see he was much higher than the average Republican. Um, Mike Lee, however, scored 97%. The difference there, um, the, the biggest difference was on the immigration bill. We um, very much against the Gang of Eight. Um, we view it as giving amnesty and, and you know, when we really should be enforcing our border and, and, enforce, and enforcing existing law. And of course, Mitch McConnell, uh, just slightly higher than the average Republican at 67%. Now these, uh, these scores here at the top are again the average for that congressional um, session, the 113th. The average Republican was 61%, the average Democrat was 60, as 13%. Now um, the scores though I have here, I have Kareem Brown, and then the next person over is uh, Ron DeSantis, who, by the way, today just announced that he's going to be running for president. He, and, and these scores are from the 114. For Senator. For Senator. Thank you. Um, so these are, uh, I believe these are 13 votes since January that have been taken. So even though those scores at the top were averaged of 113, um, I have the data available. We just opened up our scores. We wanted to have a big enough sample size so before we release them. But, so DeSantis is at 100%. Then we have Rich Nugent at 73%, tied with um, Representative Webster at 73%. Um, the, the, and again, you can see, you know, this is just a sample of three out of the 13. Um, so Representative Webster voted with us on the amendment to um, stop the Davis-Bacon Act from going in force. The death tax repeal, he voted, we were for that, he voted for it. And the difference here would have been um, the dock fix. Um, we were really pushing this issue hard um, we've, we've, it passed, so we weren't successful, but that was a, um, ends up going to be a $500 billion increase to our national debt over 20 years. So I see one of your tenants here, fiscal responsibility, <laughs> definitely violated that principle. Um, and, and we're certainly, we're not against, we were not in favor of having the um, doctors that take Medicare patients to pay the bulk of the price but there was a, a, a cap in place called the sustainable growth rate. Anytime the cost of Medicare would rise higher than the, than the economy in general, it kind of forced that um, either you cut the doctor's reimbursements or you make offsets somewhere else. And that's what they did the, for the last 17 times this happened. They would make budget offsets somewhere else. Now that we've got um, Republican-controlled Congress, 
you know, you would think that nothing would change, or if there were reforms made, it certainly wouldn't be a five hundred billion dollar, you know, tag uh, tag against the economy. Um, unfortunately, they just decided to do away altogether with the cap and not do budget offsets, and that's how we ended up. And that's why we um, key voted against that bill. So um, also on our website, you'll see a tab, it's called the dashboard. And when you click that, again, you go to heritageaction.com, you click the dashboard, you put in your zip code, and it'll, it'll pull up your number, and you, um, you get a profile like this. And I'll go a little bit closer so you can see. So we see that um, you get all the information, kind of a one-stop shop for, for your activism. Um, you can see his party affiliation, he's been in office since 2010. And this is a really uh, kind of a key indicator that's called the Partisan Voter Index, your PDI score. And that's, um, that's an indication on how conservative your district is compared to the nation. So anything, uh, uh, you, you'd be like an R plus five or an R minus five, that would tell you that um, your district voted for the Republican in the last two presidential preferences at a um, rate of 5% higher than whatever the delta was. Um, let's say it was 2%, your, your delta was 7% was seven so the delta would be five in that case. So um, it's kind of an indication of, of how conservative you are. Like I said, plus five or minus five is anything in between. There was a swing um, district, anything higher is not. And the PBI said you just kind of outside the margin of, of you know, having concerns. You click on the um, F, blue F for Facebook, you'll get his, pull up his Facebook account, you can pull up his Twitter account. The little envelope will take you right to the place where you can send him a note via email through his house website. And if he has any YouTube videos, you can click on that so you can kind of get all that information. And then we always have a message that we have, um, whatever the current issue, I told you they change all the time. Um, right now, this one is actually a message. Um, Representative Webster has come out in support um, of letting the Export-Import Bank um, kind of expire. It's supposed to expire at the end of June. So that's another issue that we're working on really hard. So we, you know, we don't always want to attack when they're doing something good. We also want to thank them. So we have just a, a little message, um, you know, if you want to do some activism this week, that's something that you can do. Um, it'll give you talking points. And at the very bottom, you can click this um, phone icon, make the call. It doesn't dial it for you, but it pops up the number to dial, and then there's a space in there after you talk with the person at the other end. Just that's how we get that intel. Remember I said that intel <coughs> comes to us? Well, that's your way of, of giving us that intel. And it helps us if it's this particular issue that we're whipping and we really, you know, it saves us a lot of time to try and figure out where a member is if, if our activists are already, you know, making those calls and letting us know. So it kind of simplifies the process, makes us a lot more efficient. And then if any of you tweet, we've got a, a pre-made up tweet, tweet on here. So all you have to do is log in and just click one button and you just tweet it to the universe, you know, whatever um, the message is. So uh, really no excuse at this point not to, to use Twitter because it, it, it's really so easy and it, and it really is very um, uh, effective at, at activism. Karen? Yes. Just because I've done that and one mm -hmm. of the things that never really soaked in is that by asking the staff, because they won't they can't usually put you in touch with the, the elected representative uh, if they know what the position is. Sometimes they know, yes. and sometimes they don't, so we feed that to you, and then your lobbyists then have that information. Exactly. And that's part of what this whole process does. Exactly. I mean, that, there's many examples of that where, um, I just had one today, where we had a member who um, had written a constituent letter in June of 2014 and said, and he had voted against the Export-Import Bank reauthorization in 2012, and he wrote a constituent letter in June, July of 2014 that said he would never reauthorize the Exxon Bank if it came forward. Well, today she called him, and he said, the person at the other end said, he's for reauthorizing the Exxon Bank. And we have a website that has all the members to thank for being on it. So we're like, okay, we need to, we need to go back and have a, a chat with this guy and see where he's at. So that's exactly right. It, it is useful information, and, and, and if you get something counter to what we're thinking, that raises a flag, or if, if you're not sure if he's on the fence, I've got um, Nugent is very much on the fence on this issue. Um, so, you know, it just helps us to, in our targeting, and, and um, a lot of times I'll get constituent letters, and, and it helps us identify, you know, where, where's, where do we need to kind of do a little bit more 
uh, research so that we can provide you the tools then to kind of convince them to come the other way. So we try and be a resource in that area too. But your the information, the feedback you give us is, is invaluable. And I can tell you many, many stories on how that, that's helped. But um, it, it costs nothing to become a Sentinel. You just can sign up on the back. You can sign up on our website. And um, one of the things we do to um, equip our Sentinels is we have a Monday call. It's called our Sentinel Strategy Call. And we have uh, Russ Vogue, who's our political director up in DC. He'll talk for about 15 minutes about what the issues are. And I'll kind of give you a, a flavor that um, I'll talk about some of the issues that we're kind of working on right now. Gives you a lot of the behind the scenes lots of lots of information about the process, about um, you know the policy and kind of the process behind it and the politics going, the underlying politics of it. So if you have any interest in kind of the getting under the hood and, and finding out more um, about how DC works, it's not pretty sometimes. <laughs> It's quite discouraging at times, but um, it can be very rewarding when, when we have these successes that, that we do. Um, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but we do have uh, many successes. And then also we have events um, and skills clinics. We try and teach you how to tweet, um, how to get published, letter to the editor. Um, we feel that's a really good way to spread the message, especially to the, the ill-informed <coughs> to still get their information from the paper. It's really good to, um, you know, for also, the electeds um, really do take a look at what are my constituents, where they can get a feel, where are they at this issue. And you, you never know, you know, that you, that could be the difference from somebody who is on the fence, let's say on XM, and they're like, a, you know, roll the dice and they happen to see a constituent with that letter. So, you know, these things all can work together and, and move the ball forward for conservatism. So we try and have Sentinels know the issues, grow their skills, and then go out and lead. Um, so some of the topics that we're working on, um, we talk, of, we're working on education, um, I told you about the export bank, um, healthcare policy, um, a lot of them have one thing in common, and again, it's, it's one of the things that I think you all know about because, you know, constitutional government is, is what our country is and what we're trying to preserve. Um, one of the concepts of our government is the concept of federalism, where you can have a federal government and a state government, and they have defined um, roles and responsibilities, actually enumerated in our Constitution, or what the um, powers are of the federal government. And of course, anything that is not enumerated is, according to the Tenth Amendment, uh, reserved back to the, the people and to the states. So, very important concept, one that I wish our president, a constitutional lawyer, um, would, uh, would identify with. Um, so, knowing that, most of these issues, there is kind of a violation of that, that federalism um, concept. And an example that happened, and I remember it, I still have a 16-year-old son, who by the way, today I had to take him, he's in the virtual school, and I had to take him to his fifth Common Core assessment across town. So, um, but, uh, so I was very aware, very well aware in 2009, in September, uh, President Obama gave a back-to-school speech. And uh, the schools across the nation were highly encouraged to bring out the TV and turn on the president so that he could indoctrinate or speak to um, the members, uh, to all the kids across the nation. And uh, there was a lot of pushback, especially because one of the things they did was they, the Department of Education handed out lesson plans. And one of the lesson plans for the kids in high school was that they were to write an essay describing how they were gonna help the president get his agenda passed. I don't know if you all remember that. I do. I was living, all three of my kids were in school that year in three different grades, and all three of them watched that, that address. So, um, but there was some pushback and uh, I bring that up just to, to show you that there, there is an effort by the feds in violation of law to interject their, um, you know, their, their ideas and positions you know, on, on our school children. And um, you know, it, it, it can't stand. So they got some pushback. And so they resorted to another method of coercion. Um, going back, and now I'm going to go back in time now to 1965 and talk about the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. 
That was under Lyndon Johnson, and that bill was very noble in, in, uh, in the beginning. Like most bills, there was good intentions, right? They, yeah, good intentions, lead where? Um, they, they were trying to balance the, um, the funding in the different schools to try and, you know, some kids were in school districts that were not as, you know, rich as others. Some had, you know, nice clean desks and, you know, buildings and other ones didn't have even textbooks to use. So um, that's, it was start of the war on poverty in um, 1965. Um, it was a 32 page bill and I think it was a billion dollars. It was, you know, just kind of starting out, so to speak. Um, that bill would get reauthorized every five or six years. There was a huge rewrite in 2001 um, called No Child Left Behind. Now for the first time in this rewrite, there was a mandate that all the states had to test the children. It wasn't very prescriptive in what had to be tested, but it was the start of, um, we want to see adequate yearly progress, and in order to continue to receive these funds, remember it started at a billion, well it's growing now, right? Um, the states get addicted to that federal money. There's a lot of strings, this is one of them. So, <clears throat> So they, they had that mandate for national testing and they could withhold the funds if adequate yearly progress was not attained. Well, what happened? A lot of the states, you know, they had their own standards, but then they started watering them down because they wanted to make that progress look better and better. So, um, so you know, you could start to see, um, as you all, I'm sure, aware, government is going to do whatever it takes to get that money and, and cook the books, so to speak. In 2011, it got really hard to compete and to, and to continue to get adequate early progress. So uh, the president stepped in and he said, well, um, I got a deal for you. Um, we'll still give you those funds, um, but all you have to do is sign here and accept a common set of, a set of standards common to many states, which ended up being Common Core. And the state of Florida did that in 2011. Now, I told you in the beginning about um, you know, what happened with the back to school thing in 2009. This is what the New York Times wrote February 9th of 2012. Florida was one of the first states to take um, the Common Core, adopt the Common Core. And they said, quote, Florida is the, quote, first group to receive waivers from the Bush era law in exchange for embracing the Obama administration's educational agenda. And they did it without any uproar from parents or anybody else at the time, it kind of flew under the radar. So they got what they wanted. This is typical of how government works. And um, now Florida is entangled in Common Core, and it uh, hasn't really been a, a, a way to unravel it at the federal level, and there still isn't. It has to be done at the state legislature level. But there are things that we can do on the federal level, because that No Child Left Behind now um, has expired, and it needs to be, uh, well, we say expired, but it's been that way for a few years. Um, but unfortunately, the Republican Congress has decided to come in and rescue it, and let's reauthorize it, okay? And uh, let's make it a seven-year reauthorization so that if we do um, get a conservative president and then you have uh, control of the Congress, that you know, they could really kind of route this, this thing out. Um, doing a seven-year bill, reauthorization bill, would actually keep it in place until that, person, that new president's second term. So render, render you know, any ability to do anything at the federal level, um, you know, just no way to, to do that, to unshackle it. So what does this new reauthorization, it's called the Student Success Act, it's um, HR 5. Well, uh, remember the 32-page bill in 1965? Um, the 2001 rewrite was 600 plus pages. The, the new one that actually was supposed to be voted on February 27th and um, Boehner thought he had all the votes. Um, we mounted a campaign back then. Other groups did too, and they had to pull the bill. But we, we're hearing now it's coming back. But um, supposedly with these changes, the bill is, behold, still 600 plus pages long. It still has mandates. The state shall, the local school district shall. There's still these mandates from the federal government. It doesn't eliminate any of the numerous 90-some-odd um, programs. What it does is it consolidates them, but it doesn't eliminate any. 
And we know that because the funding level is the same. There's no, there's no change to the funding level. So, um, but the big issue, the big issue we have with this, um, there should be a conservative alternative put in there, a provision put in there that would allow the states to just simply say, you know what, thanks federal government, um, you know, this is an excellent program, but we'll take care, we'll just take our money and do our own thing, thank you very much, and, and have the funds block granted. Now, Congressman DeSantis actually was the um, House member who, when this bill, H.R. 5, went through the Rules Committee, has to go through the Rules Committee before then it goes to the floor to a vote, he introduced an amendment to, um, it's called the A-plus Act, and the A-plus Act just basically does that. It says <coughs> states can opt out and they can get their money block granted. He was denied the ability to even have that amendment voted on um, by, our, by our current Congress. So um, what we, we support the A-plus Act. We will remain um, key voting against H.R. 5 unless that provision is put in there because it, what does it do? It balances that federalism. The states can, can decide to take on these regulations or they can decide to opt out because really it's not enumerated in that constitution, therefore it is the right of the people in the states to do. So that's, that's where we come out on HR 5. This bill, since it's already gone through the Rules Committee, um, it was pulled from the floor, that means it can come back a lot quicker now because it doesn't have to go through that process. So um, what we're encouraging folks to do I didn't have the last slide. We're encouraging folks to you know, contact Representative Webster, contact Rubio and Nelson, and tell them to vote no on HR 5, the Student, Student Success Act. Um, another issue that we are getting involved in is the, um, Iran, the President's Iran nuclear deal, where they're looking to give um, Iran relief from the sanctions um, with really not a whole lot in return. So. Um, the bill that is currently in the Senate is called um, Senate Bill 615, sponsored by uh, Corker and Car Cardine. It's called the Corker Cardine Bill. And what this does, instead of this massive nuclear um, agreement being brought before the Senate as a treaty, which would require 67 senators to approve, the Senate decided, you know what we're going to do is we're going to create this new bill, and instead of voting for this, we're going to vote. A, a, a disapproval. So you're pretty much upending those numbers. Instead of requiring 67 then to override a veto, because it's a, it's a now it's called a disapproval <coughs> of vote, the president can veto it, and now it changes the ball, so there would have to be 67, uh, Repu um, well I said Republicans, I shouldn't say that, it, 67 people opposed to the agreement to, um, to keep the president from doing that action. It's a very high bar, a lot higher than getting 67 to approve the agreement. So um, what's, what we're setting up is for the president to be able to have this agreement the way he wants it, um, and, uh, and he can say, look, you, you failed to override my veto of the disapproval, therefore, implicit to that, you're, it's, a, it's an implicit agreement, an implicit approval. So rather than going through the normal process, um, you know, it's really made the bar a lot harder for us. Um, so we're just saying, look, vote against it. It's really, there's nothing, there's no reason to vote for this bill. There were some attempts to add amendments. Um, we were hopeful with um, one amendment that would uh, require a provision that Iran would have to accept Israel's right to exist. That was not uh, put in there. Um, and uh, there was another amendment by Tom Cotton and it looks like this is going to go down. It looks like it's going to pass. So we don't have as much leverage in the House, thankfully, or excuse me, in the Senate, but thankfully it does have to also be approved by the House. So this Senate Bill 615, you need to let Webster know that, you know, if you agree with what I'm saying, to oppose um, S615. Yes? Just a question. How can they do that? The Constitution is what says the treaty has to be approved. How can they pass it? They're law? not classifying it as a treaty. Oh, but it is a treaty. It's an agreement with a foreign nation of major significance. Uh, we believe it should be a treaty. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and, you know, it's, it's government, 
you know, continues to go over the bounds unchecked over time, people just think it's normal, you know, and it's 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 just where we are, unfortunately, as a country. So they gave up a winning position. The Republicans give up a winning position mm -hmm. to give the president what he wants. Mm -hmm. So what yeah. side are they on? His side. You said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to say. Yeah, it, it, it's a uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. I think that's the way you say that. Is that the way it goes? Sounds like. Um, so we believe that um, you know this should be submitted as a treaty, so it could have the 67 vote threshold, and um, you know it should not move forward. There, the Congress should. I mean, it's worse to do this bill because I told you there's an implicit agreement. If if the if the process that Congress set up couldn't stop it, then implicit is that that's implicit approval of his deal. You know, so by, does by that mean that sanctions are lifted? Yep. I mean, if that's what the agreement ends up being, now that's still, you know, I don't think the, the president's agreement is, is um, been so set in stone yet. What does Rubio say? What does Paul say? What are the people that are running for president say? Um, Rubio, I it? believe, uh, has been opposed to it, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's an area that really requires constant vigilance on. I mean, he needs a phone call just like Nelson does and just like Webster on this because. Um, I, I don't know, a, a nuclear Iran is, you know, not a thing that I feel comfortable with, you know, my kids living with. Um, so that's why we're encouraging folks, you know, that these are the types of, and these are the things you, you don't hear this in the mainstream media. I mean, the narrative is totally, um, you know, controlled and, and it always looks like, you know, hey, you know, we're now the party in power and we're making changes. But really, if you look, I mean, look at the priorities. What did they do the second or third week in Congress? They approved Amtrak, the authorization of Amtrak, or step. You know, I my um, yeah, I'm very much into the um, trains thing. My my pack that I that I helped um, co-found was called No Tax for Track, so that was personal to me. Um, but uh, anyhow, yes, Mark. Yeah, if you're interested, in, you know, Wall Street Journal had a very good um, description uh, about this about two or three weeks ago. When that laid out the parallels between the negotiations, protracted negotiations over almost eight years with North Korea, which ended up being a nuclear nation. And that those are the Iran. And what you're seeing is the is the, the play out of, of the same scenario. And it's a very complex issue. There are a number of different issues involved. And what Obama is saying is, well, the alternative is go to war in order to deny them a nuclear weapon. And that's and that's essentially the this or that type of alternative. And that's why he's selling it as being the lesser of two evils. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the framework that we're seeing is they don't have to give up any of their centrifuges. The, t the Tom Cotton Amendment was um, they need to detail exactly where they're at. Actually, it would say that you cannot use this you know, to create nuclear weapons. And you know, if those amendments aren't in there, you know, even then, is that enough? But this, um, this does start a war because Israel is going to go after. They're not going to. They're not going to sit by and let them develop. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there will be a war. Right. Well, in this in this case, Congress is better to do nothing than to pass Senate Bill 615. Right. So because at least he can't say that I'm doing it with congressional approval, like he yeah. can if this yeah. thing, you know, the, the fails to pass. So. Have this in red, urge Nelson, Rubio, and Webster to oppose Senate Bill 615. And these are the kind of types of things that we send out once a week we put out an update, or you know, if the conditions warrant it, national will put out a, a, a you know call call to action. And so it's very important that you know we link up people across the nation so that we can have this, you know, this voice that, that's working and orchestrating together to, you know, there's always power. You guys know I know you do it at the local level. I know your group is very good on the state level about putting out the Common Core Action Alerts and, and you know, they know how to, to do a coalition. Um, Export Bank, um, just, I just threw this slide in, thank him, um, and Representative Webster and Senator Rubio have come out against the Export Import Bank. This is a crony bank from FDR, and with the conservative Congress can't get rid of an FDR era program, there's really no hope. <laughs> so Webster and Rubio have both indicated that they will not vote to reauthorize this. So. Our thanks are in order if that indeed um, does come to pass. 
it, it, the charter is set to expire June 30th. There's a bill, HR 597, that would actually reauthorize this. There's 60 co-sponsors, Republican co-sponsors on this bill. Um, we've got a website um, that has 84 people on record uh, as opposing it, but I told you one of those guys I heard today may be peeled back. So, you know, um, it would, if you are calling on some of the other things, tell Webster, you know, banks remain strong on keeping um, the XM from being reauthorized. And then the last thing, transportation is, like I said, my kind of pet thing, um, is there is now the transportation funding is set to, the, 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 the continuing resolution, well, on the transportation spending, it's due to expire at the end of this month, this month of May. And um, that is the Highway Trust Fund. The funds for that program come from the pump. Every time you buy gas at the gas station, you pay a federal gas tax that goes up to D.C. Now that tax was instituted in 1956 by Eisenhower for uh, a program of national interest, very good at the time, gave us our interstate highway system. Pretty much got built out in the 80s. Um, so rather than let a tax expire, politicians don't want to give up that power base, um, they found creative ways to spend the money. Um, that's why um, you're seeing in my county, um, the county trying to go after federal funds for light rail, that they can have the capital costs paid for by the taxpayer of the United States. <laughs> you guys here closer to home, you have some rail. Same thing, you've got you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds, you know, why not? It's free. Well, the problem is the operating costs you gotta come up with every year, right? It's like a boat anchor. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, that's kind of out there. Um, there uh, have been calls by the Republicans, not all of them, to increase the federal gas tax. Rather than roll it back to the states, Remember that concept? It's now, it's not a national interest. Um, let's let the states take it over. Um, this uh, is a letter to the editor from Governor Rick Scott, who published it in my paper on February 4th, and, and it is a plea to the Fed saying, don't raise the gas taxes. We are bringing jobs back to Florida because of low taxes, right? We all can agree as conservatives that that, you know, better than anything, all these economic development schemes, if you peel back regulation and lower taxes, you allow the um, uh, ingredients for economic growth. Um, so there are some that I've heard, um, it's not mainstream, but there's a couple that are calling for a dollar a gallon increase in the gas tax. They want to get you out of your cars and coerce you onto these trains. Um, trust me, there, there is a, a component of that. Um, we have a better solution. We are in favor of a bill called the Transportation Empowerment Act. And what this would do is phase out that federal tax over five years. So it's not a big jolt to the feds. You phase it out, you leave 3.7 of the 18.3 cents um, with them. I mean, there's, there's probably some, you know, uh, something that they need it for, you know, let's, let's let them keep a little bit. Um, and then allow the states to control where the funding goes, what the priority is. Because what makes sense in Florida may not make sense in New York. Um, you know, so let us control those decisions and, and uh, do what's best for Florida. Now, there's a lot of people opposed to this, a lot. The Chamber of Commerce is one. Um, you've got a lot of um, bigger special interests. In fact, they formed a coalition called the Transportation Construction Coalition, and they set out to prove if this Transportation Empowerment Act passes, this is how much each state would have to raise their gas tax to replace the amount of funds you get in from that 18.4 cents. Well, guess what? Florida would have to increase their gas tax 11.5 cents to save 18 cents at the pump that we're sitting in the feds. So their own information shows that Florida is a donor state. We don't get what we put back in. So, um, you know, Georgia, look at them. They get, they're really probably mad. You know, they have to raise their their tax is 10 cents to get the same level of funding. So we use this chart, their chart, to show how the disparity is and how some states are penalized. You know, why should you know Florida have to fund Georgia's transportation needs? You know, it just doesn't make sense. So um, on the Transportation Empowerment Act, we're looking to ask Webster and uh, both Rubio and Nelson to co-sponsor that. When we get enough, I'll get you just a second. When we get enough co-sponsors on a bill that builds the momentum, that it can come to the floor. 
There's huge resistance, there's big special interests against this idea because, um, especially politicians, because you've got bureaucrats and politicians in 49 other states controlling that big pot of money. It's one of the biggest pots of money in DC. So this is one way to kind of, you know, kind of lower those, those um, power uh, sources so that we can start to, as you know, we the people, to start to gain control back to our government. And yes, Mark, you had your hand up. Yeah, well, one of the arguments that people need to, to bear in mind why having the money uh, come to the states without going to the federal government is the strings that are attached to the federal funding. Uh, everything from the minimum wage that they uh, uh, attach for contractors who are using federal funding, so you have a higher minimum wage other strings that they use to coerce us for unrelated transportation issues, such as real ID uh, and, and enforcement of that, changing the drinking age. All these are transportation dollars that we were threatening to withhold. And if you remove that pot of money from their control and cut those strings, then you reduce the coercive effect of the federal government on the states. Absolutely. So even if the state too. has to raise the money by savings beyond just the fact that we're a donor state, as was pointed out by parents, oh, yeah. but you also are cutting strings, and it's the strings they want to keep. And a great example, um, after the 2010 uh, defeat of the sales tax, they had proposed a $1.7 billion train um, that would go from downtown to USF uh, it was, uh, at a cost of $1.7 billion. Um, I lobbied the county commission and got appointed. I still am on, I'm now the vice chair of the Heart Board, which is our transit board. Well, in 2011, we embarked on a bus rapid transit system that covered the same corridor as this proposed $1.7 billion thing. It was funded by county dollars, not federal dollars. We were able to get this, what was gonna take them 10 years to do this train. We did it in a year. Um, and it was buses. It had some of the features. It had, you know, some nice um, bus stations that where you could buy the ticket at the station rather than when you board the bus, it kind of clogs it up. And it had limited stops, and, it, and it, you could go much faster um, than the projections were of the train at a cost of, it was proposed to be $32 million. We, the, the agency did it for 25 million and returned almost $9 million back to the county. And the ridership is almost what your Sunrail does on this one bus route. And so that's 1 60th of the, of the cost. And one of the reasons is we didn't have to do the Davis-Bacon um, union wages. Uh, we didn't have to do all the environmental programs that the federal dollars would require. So absolutely, you know, you, when you can do things with local dollars, you don't have to, you know, abide by all these strings and impediments that the feds do. So, <clears throat> so anyhow, Transportation Empowerment Act, we're, um, you know, very much trying to get that uh, message out. So Webster, this is one area that we really need help on. He sits on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee that actually makes all these determinations and um, not getting a sense that he's for this. So. Any you know, hearing from you that this is important to you would be very helpful. He sits on three subcommittees too, so he's very much uh, wields a lot of power in the transportation funding area of the federal government. So, what about John Michael? Yeah. John Michael was chairman up until a few years ago. Um, still on the committee, still wields a lot of power. Um, oh, sure. However, <laughs> we had um, we had a group the. Is it the Eastern Orlando Tea Party? Yeah. Um, got on him about it. He Skyped in and he promised he would do it. Uh, some of the members there kept dogging him on it and he eventually co-sponsored. That was huge because when he co-sponsored that bill, it was last fall, then I had a sentinel who met with Mario diaz Villart, who was like a 33% on their scorecard, just so you know where he stands fiscally, um, told her, you know, look, I don't, I don't, co-sponsor bills that, you know, uh, you know, I just have my own pet projects. And um, she said, well, you know, John Micah just co-sponsored this bill. And he says, really? John Micah co-sponsored this? 
Uh, within a week, he added his name as a co-sponsor on it. So I mean, there, there is some, and, and Nugent had a new, um, a Sentinel working on Nugent that got him on the bill. Um, you know, a couple days after he talked to him about it, he was on it. It was over the August recess. Um, the very next day um, in September when they came back, it, you know, we were like, what, where did Nugent come from? And I called up Bill, who had been working on him. He says, yeah, I had a conversation, and I wasn't sure where it was going to go. He said he'd consider it, and lo and behold, he added his name. So like I said, if we can get to these guys and have more people co-sponsoring these bills, you know, we can really affect changes um, in the way we're doing our business. So going out and leading, we, we just, um, my job is to be a resource to you with information, if there's any help, um, we do skills clinics on, like I said, I, I teach social media, Facebook, Twitter, how to use that to lobby a member of Congress. Uh, we encourage town halls. I know Webster goes out, um, I think, did he speak here recently? Um, I know he spoke at several other um, tea parties as well. So um, his district has the most tea party um, groups that I've seen of any member in Florida. So um, you all can really make a difference. And, and, you, and we actually have seen his score going up from, from where it was last session. So um, we just need to keep um, having that conversation with him and, and uh, you know, we can get them to um, see the light. And again, just another um, plug for Sentinel. Uh, there's um, just a little paper. If you can just give us your phone number, your name, your email, um, that's all it takes. And you can be on these Monday night calls. You can receive a lot of this information. You can, you can spend as little or as much time as you want on, on the program. Um, but it is very helpful to us if you help us with these um, call action alerts to, to make the calls and um, on certain bills. So that's all I had. I don't know. Uh, I probably went long. If I have time for q and I will certainly do that. But if, if it's too late. No, you got time. We got time. Does, does anybody have any, um, you know, kind of ask questions along the way? Uh, Jerry? What's the influence on contacting congressmen that, are, that you are not their constituent? Like if, if you financially support someone like DeSantis mm -hmm. or Mia Love mm -hmm. and say, okay, I financially support you. I'm not, a, I didn't vote for you, can't vote for you. But this, if you want <coughs> more money from me, yeah. this is what you need <laughs> right. to do. Does that have any effect? Oh, absolutely. Now just cold calling somebody outside your district isn't gonna have the same effect. So, so the first step is to contact your own member of Congress. But if you are able to contribute at a level where maybe you go to a fundraising party and there's a minimum level, you know, that's a great way to build that relationship. They'll, they'll remember you, especially if um, it's their first time running for office. Um, I had a guy who, um, Nugent ran, uh, I think it was in 2010, and he helped work on his campaign. You know, he was kind of a, you know, not many people knew his name, didn't have brand recognition, but this guy, Helped a lot, you know, walked the precincts, knew his campaign manager, who eventually became his chief of staff, um, had his, you know, this Rich Nugent's phone number so he could text him anytime he wanted. Unfortunately, in 2012, he got redistricted into a different district, and, and so we kind of um, worked on, you know, giving him some suggestions how we could build that relationship. He, in this case, um, was able to have a sit down face-to-face uh, -face meeting with Bill Arrakis after just about three or four months, what he did is he started by visiting the local office and getting to know the front staff and found out he was a veteran. He got redistricted, it was a new area. They were really looking for um, folks because they were new, you know, the constituents were new to him at the time in this particular area. They opened an office and um, so they invited him to be on the Citizens Advisory Committee, the Veterans Advisory Committee, so he has conversations via Skype occasionally with them. And eventually, he requested and got a you know twenty minute sit down face to face with his member of Congress. So, you know there are ways that you can have influence. You know, being a, a, a donor, if you have that capability, is, is an excellent one, and, and it doesn't have to be in your district. But obviously, the more you give, the, the more attention you're going to get. So, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I have a different problem. Uh, I confess, I am in Corinne Brown's oh. district. <laughs> so I donate to oh, Webster. You I donate to Webster. I send my letters to Webster. Do you have any suggestions? I haven't even bothered to contact uh, Representative Brown. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, you know, when they're at 5%, 10%, you know, it's usually, you know, just an error in voting um, <laughs> in a lot of times. Um, you know, the best bet as far as your activism there is just try and educate the people with letters to the editor and you can use, and the thing about social media, especially Twitter, is they don't know what, if you're a constituent or not. There's a level of anonymity 
Um, and, and the nice thing about Twitter, and the reason we like it, is because like, if you were to email your member of Congress, it's a private communication between you and them. If you tweet it, it's a public statement, and they don't like it when they can't control the message. Um, I had a sentinel in a, in a, a district on the East Coast, and I'm not going to give the name of this particular representative out, um, who, she was tweeting on something, and eventually the communications manager it caught the attention, and he pretty much ran the Twitter account. So he called her up out of the blue. I don't even, she didn't, to this day, I don't know how he got her phone number. And um, they had a conversation the next day. It was Posey. Uh, Posey called her the next day, and they had a half-hour chit-chat. So um, especially, you know, I mean, you don't want to, you never want to, you know, tweet anything you know, majorly bad, but you can certainly get your point across. And, um, and if they see dissatisfaction, you know, you may get the attention that each, each one's different. Posey also will actually comment. He's the one commenting behind his Facebook. Facebook's another way. When they have a page, you can make comments. You know, it just depends on the numbers. Some have, you know, uh, Trey Radel, who, um, when, when he was in office before he got caught, um, he, he was the guy behind the tweet, Twitter account. So if you tweeted him and it was right before vote, it's like texting him. You know, because he'll get it and he'll respond it. Not only do they get the text, but they also get an email saying, hey, somebody, you know, tweeted you. So, you know, there's a lot of power in using these vehicles for, for lobbying. So, but yeah, it, it, you're at a, it is much tougher in a, in a, a district like that to, um, to, to make a difference. But we still need to keep, you know, they need to be able to say, hey, you know, it's not unanimous what I'm doing. There is some dissent in my constituents. And, but it's, it is tougher. Yeah. Yes, Vance? It's great that we focus, or Heritage Action focuses on federal issues. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time for the Florida district to set the up bar and to create a Florida only Heritage Action so, group. Yeah. Well, <laughs> In we, your spare time, yeah. when can you get that done? <laughs> the way we're set up, I'm not allowed to do any state lobbying um, as much as I would love to do that. Um, there are some state groups. I'd love to see a, a, a grassroots uh, you know, Tea Party group come up and kind of fill the board. And you've got AFP, wonderful organization who does, you know, some state level stuff. There's some other groups. You've got James Madison um, Institute. But um, right now we're not, we're just not structured that way. And I, but I appreciate that. I, you know, maybe yeah, we'll get there one day. Next year. <laughs> next year. So anyhow, well, thank you all very much. You have a great group and uh, just wonderful.